So in interest of time, we're gonna move on to the third speaker. Uh, a few years ago, I was someplace else and uh, I had decided to leave and people, I decided to come to Arkansas and people asked me why. And first and foremost, it was because of John Arthur. Uh, you can't really find a better person to work with and for. And one of the other reasons was actually Nathan Caracalla, who is, you know, a younger physician scientist who kind of is the gives us a lot of strength as senior people to get up and come to work because of all the enthusiasm that he constantly shows and his productivity actually with me he will have published several papers i think we're going to be on our third or fourth paper this year so it's a great honor to have nathan he's going to be talking about angiotensin 2 in aki Luis, thank you so much. I still remember the day at uh, ASN that I asked you if you would join this program and you said, we started talking to John and here we are. Okay, but I don't know if uh, I share the same thing when it comes to how I think about you, but I'll show you why. I guess everyone can see this. Uh, Again, good morning. We are, I am in Little Rock. I'm presenting from here and uh, it was a great day driving in bright and shiny. I thought, John, why didn't you just make it an outdoor event? I mean, first kidney conference, outdoor, have a big presentation. Ashita, probably we could do that for CRRT, an outdoor conference uh, could be the first ever. So this is how I feel every time I come after uh, Michael and uh, Ashita, I mean, obviously Michelangelo painted that and uh, Mona Lisa, the most uh, famous painting. And again, uh, I have to follow the person who is probably the most prominent uh, speaker when it comes to CRRT. This is truly my art. This is what I made for my daughter on, my, on her birthday. So this is exactly how it's probably gonna look. And they didn't disappoint uh, when it comes to their talks, probably my talk is gonna be just like what I think it is. So the, my talk is gonna be on uh, angiotensin II in AKI or ANG2 uh, as I'm gonna call it, or AT2 as uh, the authors have uh, named it. Uh, why do we really even need to talk about septic shock or vasodilatory shock? Uh, Louis always tells me when you're giving a talk, think about why should the participants even listen to you? Is there a problem that you're trying to solve or is this one in a million problem? Just looking at the Medicare data, there were 100,000 admissions from septic shock. This is 44 million people who are getting Medicare, not the 300 million in US. Out of which the incidence from what we know in septic shock is about uh, 40 to 60% of these patients develop AKI and about 20 to 30% need renal replacement therapy. So if nephrologists are thinking, why am I talking about a drug that is important in septic shock? we are gonna see a ton of these septic shock patients and this is gonna change how we practice medicine. From there, let's see what my objectives are. It's gonna to be to examine the homeostatic mechanisms during hypertension and shock, then assess the current trends of vasopressor use, evaluate the role of angiotensin II in uh, management of septic shock and possible role of uh, ANG2 in improving renal outcomes. So, just looking at physiological response to hypotension, whenever there is shock or hypotension, our body really knows how to respond to it. That's why we don't see a lot of these patients who are septic really become hypotensive every single time. And what are the mechanisms? First, hypotension broadly is sensed in the carotid body, the aortic arch, and the kidney. And once it's sensed, uh, the stretch receptors in the carotid body and the aortic arch send signals down the glossopharyngeal and the vagal nerve to the posterior pituitary and the sympathetic pathway. And the sympathetic system releases the catecholamines through their alpha-1 receptor action, act on the vascular smooth muscles, causing vasoconstriction. Beta-1 receptors on the heart cause increased uh, cardiac output. But also there is the sympathetic pathway also influences the kidney to release renin, but most of it comes from the GJ apparatus, uh, which increases renin secretion, 
which converts angiotensinogen to ang1, and that is converted in presence of ACE to ang2, which in turn causes increased sodium absorption, but also causes uh, activation of AT1 receptors on the smooth muscle cells, causing vasoconstriction. And your vasopressin or ADH, which is under the control of uh, the stretch receptors and also slightly under the control of uh, ANG2, causes V1 receptor activation and vasoconstriction. And through the increased sodium absorption and uh, increased volume, you have increased stretch of your left ventricle, increased cardiac output. So the reason I'm showing you this is physiologically, there is not one mechanism that controls or manages hypertension, but there, is, there are multiple pathways that the body uses to actually address hypertension. What do we do pharmacologically? This, this is data from Mayo Clinic, uh, Kasani's uh, group really looked at what their use of pressors look like in the ICU. This is all ICU, not just medical, but medical and surgical ICU. The three main pressors we use are norepinephrine, then uh, vasopressin, and epinephrine. And with uh, phenylephrine and dopamine being used in about 10 to 20%. But when we look at the medical ICU, especially septic shock patients, 90% of these septic shock patients receive norepinephrine, and then about 20% receive vasopressin, and everything else is at less than 10%. Looking at this pharmacological response and knowing what physiologically the body does, just let's look at uh, the response to hypertension. Obviously, the most important thing is increasing cardiac output and increasing blood pressure. So how do we increase cardiac output? Using uh, through the increased heart rate, through uh, beta-1 receptors, increased stroke volume, again, through beta-1 receptors on the myocardium, but also the RAS increases sodium retention, volume expansion, and increase in diastolic volume. And when you think about blood pressure, it's cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. So obviously there is a big component of systemic vascular resistance that plays a role, which is controlled by alpha-1, V1 of the vasopressin um, or vasopressin on V1 receptors and angiotensin-2 on the AT1 receptors. The reason I use green and red, our pharmacological approach is targeting these four pathways, but unfortunately the two pathways. So about a third of the pathways that are important in managing hypotension have not been really utilized. So with that came this ATOS trial, use of angiotensin II infusion in high output shock. The first paper was a very small pilot study that used only septic shock patients already on norepinephrine, divided it into two groups, people getting placebo, versus angiotensin II added over uh, norepinephrine. It was a 10 and 10 patients, and it was a small study. And what did they do? They infused ANG2 at a rate of 20 nanograms per kilogram per minute, could be titrated up to maintain a map of 65 mm Hg. And this was done for six hours. And the only endpoint they wanted to look at was what would happen to norepinephrine dose. And they saw that the placebo group needed a norepinephrine dose of 27.6 micrograms per minute versus 7.4. I mean, you can see over here, there was a significant separation that almost started immediately. The norepinephrine dose came down and or even the ANG2 dose was drastically reduced by about three to four hours. And at six hours, obviously they had to stop it as per the protocol. With that data, they went into a more larger randomized control trial, looking at the efficacy of ANG2 for treatment of vasodilatory shock or septic shock and in unresponsive or vasopressin um, resistant hypotension or shock. They enrolled more than 300 patients, 163 in ANG2 and uh, 158 in the placebo group. The ANG2 group would start getting an infusion of angiotensin II at 20 nanograms per kilogram per minute could be titrated up to about two or to a max of 200 nanograms per kilogram per minute. And the inclusion, as I said, was vasodilatory shock after adequate volume resuscitation. 
And then they had to have high vasopressor already running that is greater than two micrograms per kilogram per minute of norepinephrine or an equivalent of uh, another vasopressor. So these were not vasopressor naive patients. They were already on pressors by that time. And the endpoints were pretty simple. The primary endpoint was, can the patients reach a map of 75 mm Hg or higher? And this slide shows you that there was a significant separation at three hours. The angiotensin II group really had a significant increase in MAP compared to the placebo group. There was no argument on this. And this continued even afterwards. And look at what happened to the norepinephrine dose. There was a significant reduction in norepinephrine dose in the ANG2 group compared to the placebo group. So, the ANCH2 group, 70% of the patients reached the target goal of 75 mm Hg or higher versus only 23% of patients in the placebo group. And in ANCH2 group, actually, they had to reduce the ANCH2 dose in 67% uh, of the patients within the first few hours. So that's all good, but what happened to the SOFA scores or the real patient outcomes? There was a significant improvement in cardiac SOFA at 48 hours with uh, ANG2 compared to uh, placebo, but the total SOFA scores were not really any different. And mortality, really, there was no significant improvement in mortality with ANG2 compared to uh, the placebo group. That's what is seen over here. I mean, if you look at uh, mortality in the ANG uh, or survival in um, ANG2 group was 53% versus 46 in the placebo, but the p-value was not significant. So it was not a significant difference. So can we bury ANG2 right now? Why am I even talking about it? Obviously, this was one study. So the first study, the authors went back and looked at a postdoc analysis, looking at if there is a subgroup that ANG2 is going to really work in. They divided the group based on ANG1 to ANG2 ratio. And if your ANG1 to ANG2 ratio was less than 1.63, then there was in improved survival or decreased mortality compared to if your ANG1 to ANG2 ratio was greater than 1.63. So what this tells you is if you already had a good amount of ANG2 compared to the ANG1, or if there was a conversion of ANG1 to ANG2, then your survival probably would not change just by giving ANG2. You already had it. But if there was something that was preventing your ANG1 to get converted to ANG2, infusing ANG2 would be a good thing. But one of the biggest problems with this is that clinically, I don't think we have a way to measure ANG1 and ANG2 right now. I mean, that's almost impossible. And the other thing they looked at is baseline plasma renin concentration. Overall, this was, when I say population median, this is population median of the ACTOS-3 trial. Every single patient had a greater than normal renin concentration. The median renin concentration was 173 picograms, which is much higher than our normal renin. So if the renin concentration was above the median study population for the group, then there was an improved mortality with angiotensin II compared to placebo. But if the renin concentration was below the median, there was no significant difference. So renin concentrations at initiation of drug could actually aid in uh, figuring out who would need it or not. The same problem, I don't know about all of you guys, but uh, renin concentration takes about a day to be reported in our hospital. I don't think we have that kind of time. Another thing, maybe, I mean, this drug can be used as something like a furosemide stress test. You give someone furosemide within three hours, you know if they're gonna have a good renal outcome or not. You just, three hours, they don't make 300 cc's, I tell them put a catheter in, we are probably gonna need dialysis on this patient. Similarly, at 30 minutes of initiation, if the ANG2 dose was not dropped below five, nanograms per kilogram per minute, the patients had a significantly worse outcome. And if you could drop it less than five nanograms per kilogram per minute, then probably your outcomes are good. I mean, there are a lot of times that the patients would ask or the families would ask, 
is there one last thing before we give up? Maybe this is that one last thing you want to look at. But let's uh, talk about where we are right now. We are not in palm con, we are not in critical care con, but we are in kidney con. So what does this all have to do with kidneys? I mean, how is ANCH2 going to be helpful in kidneys? So I guess we heard the two talks and uh, I think Michael really put it together when it comes to MAP and uh, circulation and how MAP affects your kidneys and all those things. Do we need to switch from our current approach of brain and heart first to a kidney protective approach? I think we, especially in the ICU, it's all about the brain and heart. And uh, I understand their thing is there is always a replacement for the kidney. So with that said, is ANCH2 a friend or a foe? We all have read about ANCH2. We all know about ANCH2 being really the bad guy in the kidney, right? I mean, um, we have looked at prolonged exposure to ANCH2 causes glomerular damage, proteinuria, progression of chronic kidney disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, more predominantly in patients with chronic kidney disease, and endothelial dysfunction. This is a known fact. We, we could probably fill up this conference just with references for those uh, outcomes. Use of RAS inhibitors have shown to reduce progression, so it's not just a diagnostic, but even therapeutically, we know that just reducing ANCH2 would be helpful. So how would that be even a good choice? What we are talking about is not infusing ANCH2 for weeks, months, years. We're not even talking maybe less than a three to four days is what we are talking about. So is there a difference between infusion for just a short amount of time compared to really the extended period? So what happens when you infuse ANCH2 in AKI patients? This is data from uh, Arnaldo Lopez, who's gonna be talking after this, presented at a critical care conference. And what they did was looked at renal outcomes in patients who were treated with ANCH2 as a third presser, not even as a second pressers, compared to patients who were on three pressers, not including ANCH2. It's a retrospective study, which included 100 patients, matched for their degree of uh, illness, SOFA scores, Charleston comorbidity, and uh, also GFR. So again, these were patients who were already resuscitated with 30 milligrams per kilogram of fluid, and they were on two pressors, norepinephrine or, and, oh, sorry, come back. Norepinephrine, phenylephrine, uh, or norepinephrine, phenylephrine, or epinephrine plus vasopressin, and adding a third one on top of that compared to adding ANCH2 at uh, 20 nanograms per kilogram via a central line and titration for a map of 65. The, these were the baseline characteristics and looking at them, it appears that they were almost similar when it came to uh, their GFR, their diuretic use and SOFA scores. What did they notice? There was a significant improvement in MAP, which is goes with the theme of the ATOS-3 trial compared to the controls. And there was a reduction in norepinephrine dose in the ANCH2 group uh, compared to the control group, but still doesn't answer the question of uh, renal outcome. They looked at urine output at 24 hours or urine output for 24 hours, and they compared it till about eight days. And what was seen was that in ANCH2 group, there was statistically significant increase in urine output compared to the controls. Even in the first 72 hours, the absolute urine output increase. This was just total urine output. This was absolute urine output change from when the third presser was started was much greater in the ANCH2 group compared to the control group. So urine output, creatinine, again, how much fluid did they get? What muscle mass do they have? There's always this question. They also looked at biomarkers of kidney injury, the SAFIRE study biomarkers, nephrocheck, TIM2 and uh, IGF-BP7, there was a significant de decrease in the nephrocheck biomarkers in the ANCH2 group compared to the control group. So that probably is telling us that there is a decreased total tubular injury in these patients. 
This is how their patients looked. 52 patients on control, that's three pressors versus two pressors plus ANG to 48 patients. Out of 52, 41 patients developed moderate to severe acute kidney injury versus only 20 out of 48. So the difference was 79% versus 42% that developed moderate to severe AKI. And from this, out of 41 patients, 37 patients need adrenal replacement therapy. And only 12 out of the 20 patients with moderate to severe need adrenal replacement therapy. And the overall need for renal replacement therapy was 71% in three pressors without ANG2 versus 25% in two pressors plus ANG2. So the absolute risk reduction for moderate and severe AKI was 37%. And absolute risk reduction for requiring RRT was 46% in, with ANG2 compared to the third pressor. But what if my patient is already on dialysis? What if I'm Ashita Tolwani that runs a dialysis or ICU that has about 30 patients on CRRT every single day? So Jim Tumlin looked at the postdoc analysis of ATHOS-3 trial and just looking at patients who were already on CRRT when um, ANG2 was started. This is the baseline ca characteristics of the patients. Obviously, one thing was that uh, the MEL score was higher in the patients who were on placebo versus those who were on, um, where is the MEL score? Yeah, here, on um, ANG2. The first thing, survival was better with ANG2. Overall, mortality benefit was higher in patients who were already on renal replacement therapy when ANG2 was used as a presser. What happened to recovery from renal replacement therapy? There was better recovery in patients receiving ANG2 compared to patients on placebo. So the 28-day survival was 30% in the placebo group versus 58% in ANG2 group. And the renal replacement therapy at discontinuation at seven days was more than double the rates with ANG2 group compared to just the placebo group. So it looks like there is an added benefit in patients who are already on dialysis. That's where we come in, right? So these are all statistics, retrospective analysis. Probably statisticians know how to do it better than we do. So is this really true that ANG2 was doing anything good for the kidney or is it just smoke and mirrors? So Luis, uh, actually has done a lot of work in this field. And this is animal data where ANG2 was infused at 50 nanograms per kilogram per minute for 15 days prior to ischemia reperfusion surgery. And then ischemia reperfusion surgery was performed. This is what happened in animals after ischemia reperfusion injury. But animals that were already infused with ANG2 statistically lower serum creatinine. He didn't stop over there. He used a 81 receptor blocker, losartan, and you see how the benefit was completely negated. So it looks like it is an 81 mediated uh, effect when, it, when you look at ANG2 in kidney injury. The same study was done, similar study was done in, um, or by Belomo's group, looking at septic AKI. They used the sequel ligation and perforation model, urine output statistically lower in patients who are not on ANG2 compared to ANG2. Or sorry, this is just uh, sequel ligation without sequel ligation. So what happened when they added ANG2? Urine output improved. When you added ANG2 with losartan, no change. So you see that it's all mediated through 81 receptors. Serum creatinine, similarly, when you look at uh, losartan or only ANG2 had the best outcomes and then wakel and once losartan was added, the outcome was serum creatinine was much higher. So is this just vasoconstriction or is there something else that's playing a role? Uh, we saw from... Uh, Michael's study that way, so just having a map may not be protective. Maybe there are other mechanisms that we don't know. So 
Again, Louis Sumkos looked at uh, ANCH2 infusion prior to uh, ischemia reperfusion. And then these, the animals also received a heme oxygenase, oh, sorry, heme oxygenase 1 inhibitor. What happened? When ANCH2 was infused, decreased serum creatinine. But what if they were already given heme oxygenase inhibitor? There was no change. In fact, uh, statistically, there was no difference in serum creatinine. So what we need to understand is the RAS system is highly complex and sophisticated. This is a publication by Juan Carlos Velez, who is probably 100 times more intelligent than me, and he spent about 30 years. So I probably have to spend 300 years trying to get to this point. So this is how complicated it looks. And even if you take ANCH2 and its action on AT1 receptor, it's not one pathway. There are so many pathways that we need to look at. And I guess we are still at the point where we are not even looking at the tip of the iceberg, but maybe just the shining absolute tip of the iceberg when it comes to ANCH2 in AKI. And a lot more needs to be done. So targeting all available pathways, including ANCH2 mediated vasoconstriction appears to be, appears to improve hypotension and refractory shock. ANCH2 has, as a second pressor, has been shown to improve blood pressure rapidly. And ANCH2 has, uh, as a pressor, could uh, help in preventing acute kidney injury and could aid in renal recovery. Thank you.